Hello and welcome to the society with Fatma Shaheen at PTV World. A very famous philosopher once said that the question of animal rights doesn't accrue from whether they can reason or whether they can talk. It all accrues from whether they suffer, which we all understand that they do. Now we understand the fact that animals like human beings, they suffer from pain, they suffer from a loneliness, they can even suffer from fear, so to speak. But the most important unfortunate thing is that they are voiceless which makes it most important for us to voice their concerns to what extent have we as a society been able to do that this is something upon which we'll be shedding light during the course of today's conversation overall we'll be talking about the ever evolving status of animal rights and animal welfare as it does exist in the Pakistani society in this regard we'll also be talking about the laws and policies which already exist in Pakistan so as to cater to various cases of animal abuse abuse. We'll also be talking about the various government initiatives which have been taken by the government in a first in this regard. To name a few, we have seen that the government has introduced a chapter on animal welfare in the curriculum recently. Uh, to what extent can we expect this to be practically implemented? This is something upon which we'll be shedding light. Uh, more particularly, we'll also be talking about the national strategy uh, which is in the process of being formed with regards to addressing the issue of mistreatments of animals at zoos. Uh, what breakthrough particularly has been made on this particular issue too. That is also something upon which we will be shedding light. And last but not the least, we will also be talking about the need for us to revamp and change our mindsets when it comes to approaching animals with more compassion, with more sympathy and definitely with more empathy too. Uh, this and much more to follow on today's show, that too with a very diverse panel. Let me introduce you to my today's panel. My first panelist for the show today is Ms. Zufisha Anushe who is an animal rights activist. Assalamu alaikum ji and welcome to the show. Thank you. You are most welcome. Alongside her, I have Dr. H.M. Umar, who is a wet physician and a surgeon. Assalamu alaikum sir and welcome to the show. Thank you. You are most welcome. My third panelist for the show today is Ms. Atika Hassan, who is an animal rights lawyer. Assalamu alaikum ji and welcome to the show. Assalamu Thank you for having me. You are most welcome. As an animal rights activist, how do you see this initiative? Do you feel that at a very basic level, it will help us inculcate those compassionate values, those empathetic values in our children? Fatma, I honestly believe it's a great accomplishment. First of all, I'd like to, you know, appreciate the steps of the recent government, the PM office, who has actively been taking all these initiatives whenever we have been tweeting or, you know, any, any case that has been put forward for animal cruelty, animal abuse, be it the zoos or whatever, they have been very actively, you know, responding to us. And this... Uh, you know, specifically the curriculum is mm. a great step, you know, we're actually going in the right direction, I believe. Mm. Because school is a place, you know, where we, we need to teach children exactly. basic rights of animals. And this is something which is not new. We do see it happening in other parts of the world. And I remember a few years ago, life skill based education, that was made a very important part of the curriculum too. So if you can inculcate things like life skill based education, why not animal welfare? But moving on, when we do talk about animal rights, we also understand the fact that unfortunately, there is still that strata of the Pakistani society which does not accord that much importance to this area saying there are so many other social issues that we need to talk about. There are so many other human rights abuses that we need to address. So why should we actually talk about animal welfare or animal exploitation? So as a very strong advocate of animal rights yourself, what was it that motivated you to follow this line? Because a lot of people in your place might not have done that. I think it was, you know, a turning point for me when my own pet dog was shot and, you know, when I, you know, started, you know, get going out, getting justice for my pet dog and I realized that, you know, we're far behind. They're not going to, you know, take something legal about my dog. Hmm. So, you know, I need to start doing something. I will not take it and I will start it, initiate this, you know, the entire system hmm. for street animals, which is not there. Hmm. And I think to some extent I have been successful. Right. You know, you've been reading a lot of petitions uh, yeah, that way too exactly. and then you've been working with the government as well and then you've been working with the civil society too and one thing which I have seen happening in Pakistan that too for the better is the fact that we have seen a lot of animal right activists voicing their concerns we have seen a lot of work being done when it comes to protecting animals so overall how do you see the status of animals evolving over time I think we are going in the right direction as I said earlier because now we have support from the celebrities, we have support from the social media, we have support from the news channels and I think this is helping us 
take our concerns to the higher authorities, to the government, and we're reaching with all this information. In fact, worldwide, globally, we're, you know, able to voice our concerns for the animals now. Hmm. I think it is a great success, and hmm. I really hope, you know, things are actually being done, you know, we're going in the right direction. I think it's a collective effort. I would not say, you know, someone specific is doing it. I hmm. think it's the activists, it's the animal shelters, it's the veterinary doctors, it's the media channels, it's the select celebrities hmm. it's a lot of these people with platforms like influencers they right. play a very important role in you know hmm. talking about these issues related to animals and now collectively we you know we also you know successfully build pressures when we need right. something done like just for you know the animals in zoos the dog culling so hmm. when we collectively collectively raise our voices hmm. i think you know we somehow make a point that we will not take this we will not accept it hmm. we need answers and we don't we will not stand and you know injustice towards street animals. Uh, right Zufisha, on which I'll come to you Doc Saab and here your narrative again becomes very important. We understand the fact that season to season uh, the disease burden with regards to animals whether it's cats, whether it's dogs or for that matter any other animal that in itself varies because there may be certain seasons in which we might see an influx of certain kinds of diseases. So as a vet would you agree with that? Yes I would agree with that. Um, you know, uh, it is a saying in our in, a, in our veterinary field that uh, winter for pets and summer for vets. Right. So uh, disease incidence and their prevalences are higher in summer season compared mm. with winters. And uh, talking about what kind of diseases occur in summer season, uh, well, there are skin diseases mm. and there are gastrointestinal diseases. Mm. These two kinds of diseases are very very prevalent in this summer season. Right. Sir. And uh, above all, this heat stroke. Hmm. And it's a really serious and life-threatening issue hmm. for uh, be it's a pet animal, hmm. be it's a stray animal. Hmm. Uh, Every animal is uh, equally prone to get this heat stroke. So that would be of interest to the audience. But here, when we do talk about ailments, it's equally important that we talk about mental ailments too. Now, physical ailments, perhaps ailments like uh, cancer or any other ailment, is easier to identify because you physically see the animal falling sick. But what about when they go in a depressive state of minds? What about when they contract a different kind of mental health diseases? How do you identify those? to identify this uh, mental health of your uh, pet you have to get a very strong bond with your pet hmm. if I'm not having a very strong bond bond with my pet right. I'm unable to identify whether or not my animal my pet is going through uh, a mental trauma or mental stress right. well, talking about how to how to identify this problem is uh, I will give you some tips hmm. uh, a mentally depressed mentally depressed animal would corner itself hmm. Uh, the pet would not be, you know, showing any interest in, especially when it comes to the uh, meal time. Mm. You know, dogs, especially when we, if we talk about dogs, so uh, they are given uh, meals once daily or twice daily. Mm. Whenever it's their meal time, they won't be uh, showing any interest uh, in their food, and um, they may show aggression, mm. and uh, uh, they may not be very playful, mm. and uh, they just get in a, in a corner. Right. They are not social to you hmm. or any other family member. Even right. to the uh, person they are in very, very closest form, proximity. Right, right Doc Saab. On which I will come to you, Adhika. And here we must also, of course, talk about the various laws that Pakistan has so as to curb and, of course, so as to penalize this issue of animal cruelty as it does exist. Now, in this regard, we understand the fact that the law of Pakistan, more particularly the statutory law that dates back to 1890, which is, of course, the 19th century. Do you, as an animal rights lawyer, feel that this this law in itself is enough so as to uh, adequately address various animal rights violations. This law has never been amended um, since the 19th century, as you mentioned. And the biggest drawback in this law is that there are no definitions. There are only three words that have been described in the definition. Mm. One is animal, one is street, and one is uh, pook. Mm. It's a process. Uh, for a female animal which is obviously come under the animal cruelty. Now considering this act is prevention for the cruelty against animals, cruelty the word has not been defined. Hmm. They, uh, the, uh, the act also defines some things hmm. where it says that it might be cruelty but the cruelty itself is not defined. So absolutely insufficient and in, inefficient law at this time, law is uh, just talk about general things about animals and if you right. compare it to the laws of the other countries, especially mm. the South Asian countries, uh, you will see that this law, how 
outdated this law right. has. In terms of the issues that it does talk about, its scope is limited. One, for example, it doesn't cater to the issue of dog culling. Two, for example, then it also doesn't categorically talk about uh, the very much needed uh, issue of not using animals for entertainment. So when we talk about the purview of this law, it one way or the other relates to, uh, you know, exploiting animals through cruelty, whatever way that might be interpreted. But what about other forms of animal right violations that animals are subjected to? But when we talk about the penalties here, Ms. Atika, what are the penalties which are levied on those who actually abuse this law? Are they subjected to fines? Are they made to go to jails? Uh, there are both types of penalties mentioned in this law, the fines as well as the imprisonment. For example, 100 rupee fine or a 500 rupee maximum fine and the mm. penalties would be one month jail, 15 day jail. Mm. Those are not sufficient. Mm. If you are subjecting an animal to cruelty or killing them or torturing them in any way, 100 rupee fine is not enough. Yeah. Uh, you know how meager this is. Anyone right. can pay this penalty and go back and you know, keep going whatever they were doing. That's very rightly put by yourself, but here again, uh, one thing that we do need to emphasize upon is the fact that the stricter the punishments, the more the element of deterrence in the people from uh, steering clear of committing those particular crimes. On which I'll come to you, Zufisha. When we do talk about various animal rights abuses, when we do talk about various animal rights uh, exploitations, we have seen that uh, in Pakistan, at least, there have been those of different kinds. Number one, there have been cases where we have seen reported cases of animal cruelty, which she very rightly so mentioned. Then we have seen cases of dog culling on a very surging high. Then we have seen cases of maltreatment basically towards animals in the zoos. But overall, if you were to analyze uh, the most pressing challenges or issues which animals do face in the Pakistani society, what would those be? I think number one, it, the, the basic stigma of them being, you know, impure, the dogs. I think this is the biggest thing that they go through hmm. because the society is not ready to accept them hmm. and other than that you know dog culling is a major problem and we as you know animal shelters and animal activists we feel that we fail when we see our own you know neutered and spayed and vaccinated dogs being poisoned and shot that's hmm. that has been happening you know all over pakistan hmm. in Sindh and punjab and various other provinces. in very posh areas of yes. lahore as well so hmm. i feel that is just terrible that hmm. is how we also feel failed Hmm. So the government has to, you know, take steps in order to finish and put a complete ban on the dog, the dog culling, especially the housing societies in the residential areas, hmm. because we have to constantly, you know, be reminded and we need to remember that we need to fight rabies. Right. We need to kill rabies, not the dogs. So basically, dog sterilization in itself is enough rather than resorting towards dog culling. Exactly. But here, another very important issue on which I would want you to shed light is uh, the recent incident of uh, the elephant Noor Jahan, who actually passed away because of the neglect that she was subjected to in the zoo. Now, over a period of time, we have seen the zoo culture being basically an area of concern, being an area of criticism when it comes to animal welfare. As an animal rights activist, uh, what do you feel needs to be done to address this issue? Uh, should the momentum, should the policy initiative then come from the government in this regard? Or do you feel at a very basic level, it is the society which needs to be educated so as to be able to better treat animals whether they are in zoos or outside zoos give them a more natural and humane environment to be in because we have seen the case of Noor Jaha hmm. just because he was stolen as a baby in from some you know uh, jungle and brought to Pakistan and then being sold to the zoo along with her sisters mm -hmm. we have seen that she was just a teenager and she lost so many precious year, precious years of her life her life was, re was reduced from 50 to 70 years to just 17 years mm -hmm. and recently I you know even just before coming here mm -hmm. I've seen the post-mortem report, report of Noor Jahan and it really broke my heart mm -hmm. she had broken legs for more than four months which actually suggests the fact that she had been subjected to exactly. neglect the for neglect such a long zoos. period of time mm. because neglect if it continues for a long period of time that of course becomes a very concrete case of abuse too when we do talk about the very important role of vets like yourself what is that ideal medical standard of care which people like yourself need to exercise so as to ensure that whenever animals are being kept in zoos they are being given proper medical attention and so that incidents like these like that of Noor Jahan they don't become a common occurrence because over a period of time we have seen that this is perhaps not the first case we have seen earlier on as well I remember
remember there were the cases of younger elephants who also passed away because of uh, higher levels of stress or because of obesity and so many other medical issues. So can we not have that typical approach where we kind of make this a more on of a preventive approach rather than curing it when it occurs? Uh, we need to have uh, more effective zoo management practices. Mm. Uh, we need to give them uh, adequate space. Mm. Uh, we need to give them a very healthy diet. Mm. Uh, we need to have a regular check on the animals. I mean, uh, the, the teams, you know, the, the, the team members, the veterinarians, the staff, they already do this, but we have to do it in a better way. Mm. Capacity building of veterinarians and mm. capacity building of the zoo uh, keepers, mm. uh, animal handlers, it's, it's really crucially important. Hmm. And uh, we need to have more and more uh, trained veterinarians in our, especially zoo and wild animal uh, veterinarians uh, can, should be kept in panel. Hmm. And uh, we need to have uh, uh, up to mark veterinarians. We need to have international facilities. We hmm. need to have uh, very effective and up to mark diagnostic facilities in our zoos. Hmm. So uh, we can diagnose the diseases in time hmm. and avoid such incidences in future. Right, sir. Your point is noted on which I'll come to you, Atika. And here we understand they are a few laws in Pakistan which actually regulate the working of zoos. So tell us that what are those laws and what is the scope of such laws? How do they practically operate so as to regulate the working of zoos. Okay, so there are two things I would like to mention here. There are a couple of laws. There is a uh, uh, Punjab Wildlife Act 1974, which is also a very old law that has never been updated. And then there is uh, the Punjab Zoos and Safari Park rules, which has been amended up to, to 2017, but not significantly. Hmm. So these laws are the ones that actually regulate the management and the functions and the the processes that are you know uh, taken up in the zoo uh, in regards to again the cruelty mm. of animals mm. but what happens is that the the rules are in place excuse me the rules are in place however their implementation is not up to the mark or up to even if what's written in the mm. uh, in the act for example it specifically mentions that you are not to display a sick or a, a, an injured animal but they are being displayed right you know, just an example. Right, Atika. But here we must also talk about uh, the competing interests which do arise with regards to at one and ensuring that animal welfare, animal rights are taken care of but at the other end also ensuring that uh, economic development or for that matter land development that in itself is not impacted so as a lawyer as an activist yourself how do you feel can such competing interests be balanced because at one end you have to protect the animals but the other end you also have to do it in a manner which doesn't in one way or the other impede uh, development of the country or land development because if you are preserving their natural habitats then this also has that natural consequence of uh, one way or the other impeding land development too. Right. So the uh, the motive behind should be that we have to also preserve our ecosystem. If we do not have an ecosystem or we have a disturbed ecosystem, what are we developing our lands? Hmm. There should be certain areas that should be contained or that should be out of all this land development that should not be touched. Hmm. For example, you have seen that we have Murray. This, hmm. uh, it used to have a lot of trees. Then the trees were cut down um, uh, in a huge, huge, huge quantity. The, hmm. the, the monkeys that were living there, wildlife that was living there, they were coming up to the streets and the roads hmm. and they were, humans were either torturing them or they were scared of them. Right. So that is the direct um, uh, consequence of, uh, you know, taking taking away the natural habitat of an animal. Mm -hmm. Radhika, do you not feel that then this is just one part of addressing the problem? Another way to look at it would also be that whenever you do indulge in any kind of environmental or land development products, you need to assess the cost-benefit analysis of it so as to see that does it or does it not, you know, hamper the ecosystem or animals and humans so to speak on which I'll come to you and here we must talk about the fashion industry too. Now in this regard I was going over a report which very categorically stated that in the country of Australia 85% of the fur industry skin days come from animals who are caged in farms. Having said that this in itself becomes a reason because of which a lot of people especially animals 
flowers, they kind of not use these skins to start off with. So can we not expect people in Pakistan to do the same, especially when they know that something that they are using, a fashion accessory or otherwise, that has come at the cost of exploiting perhaps a particular animal. You knew the exact figure and per percentage of the you know number of animals that are used for these far industry in Australia but do you know about Pakistan hmm. you don't hmm. because there's no check and balance there's no completely no law to at least you know check and you know go through these factories and have a number or data that which you know which brand is using what right. which company is using what products hmm. so that is how we have still been you know failing and we hmm. lag here so I think there has to be a proper system that identifies and these products, these companies, these business, these brands need to add this thing in their, you know, websites and portfolios that what they're using. Hmm. Like, you know, I was just going through a website and getting some pillows. I was ordering some pillows online and I found out in the description that the pillows were made with duck feather. Hmm. And they did not, you know, mention on the website that they were selling, you know, cruelty-free products or right. their products are containing mm. animal fur or anything until mm. you go in the depth. And when I started inquiring, you know, mm. inboxing them and everything, they talked me. As for the, you know, fashion industry in Pakistan, just like, you know, they're doing so much, you know, globally and in internationally, I think it's high time the fashion institutes, you know, guide and educate children mm -hmm. about the alternatives because there is, you know, synthetic leather, there is synthetic fur. So they should boycott mm -hmm. these things that exploit animals and that involves the cruelty towards animals. Mm -hmm. And they should be, you know, choosing cruelty free products. Right. Even the eyelashes, the mink eyelashes, exactly. they come from a lot of, you know, cruelty. So I've never worn them. Hmm. And there are synthetic options, but we need to, you know, stand up to this abuse and say no to these products. Right, Zufisha, your point is noted. On which I'll come to you, Dog Sub, and here we must talk about this growing concern of dog bites as it does exist in the Pakistani society. So in this regard, what advice would you give to all the people out there, more particularly those who are uh, subjected to the same and who do uh, belong to the rural? areas of the country where they perhaps might not have that perfect access to the health care. Uh, what is it that they can do immediately so as to mitigate the damage? Because a lot of times we see that people living in remote villages of the country, they might not be able to go uh, to an optimum hospital immediately. Uh, we need to know first that not every uh, uh, dog is a rabid dog. Uh, if we've been bitten by a dog, uh, we have to wash the uh, bitten part of the body with uh, tap water and wash the wound with uh, uh, with the soaps and uh, we have to go to a medical facility immediately. Right, sir, your point is noted. On which I'll come to you, Ms. Atik, and here we must also talk about the international obligations which are then placed on the Pakistani state so as to ensure that animal welfare is made a reality in the country. In this regard, it's very important to then mention the OIE, of which we understand that Pakistan is a member, and this OIE very categorically then says that there are five freedoms which must be given to animals. What are those freedoms and to what extent do you feel our laws and policies comply with the same? That is a very good question. So the fundamental five freedoms that OIE has mentioned and they put the responsibility on every state, um, I read it out those, uh, read those out to you. A freedom from hunger and malnutrition, hmm. freedom from distress, uh, physical and thermal discomfort, pain, injury and disease and the last one is to express normal pattern of behaviors. Right. Relevant to their kind or right. the other kind the, in the animal kingdom. Mm. So if we go back here, I'll give back the reference of the 2019 judgment mm. by Justice Atamanilla that expresses all of these freedoms. Mm. And calling an animal a sentient being, actually, de these freedoms is what they are define, uh, right. defining in that. Mm. So these are the needs that a human also require, mm. and you know, as well as the animal. Mm. Pakistani laws, somewhere or the other, there are various different laws that do, for example, the laws about the management of the zoos, uh, mm. the safaris and the zoos, it says that keeping the animal in their natural habitat, just as an example, then they have, they're supposed to be fed properly and on time. They're supposed to have a medic medical care. They're supposed right. to have uh, comfort. These, these things are 
in laws they are mentioned mm -hmm. for the most part other than the deficiencies that we have mentioned before but the problem is with the implementation right on which i'll come to you ms zofisha and before we conclude today show her it's very important that we talk about the need to make people aware about uh, these various animal welfare laws a very important part of which is of course to also implement them so when it comes to public awareness when it comes to public advocacy what do you feel is the most effective mechanism to do the same I think in schools and in other you know universities we still talk about animals but I think the place that needs to be targeted the most is schools and madaris the right. religious institutions hmm. because those are the places everyone is going to hmm. in our country P even the people that are not you know going to schools or don't have access hmm. to the educational system they're still going to the mosques hmm. so the scholars need to you know use the islamic references and the quranic verses to educate people about the empathy and you know the love for animals that our own religion is that is know, so right that yes. is so right because islam is that one religion which emphasizes exactly. on being kind and compassionate towards animals and in this regard not only the religion itself also the fact that the government has now actually brought in exactly. this a uh, first curriculum which actually talks about animal welfare that in itself is also a very welcome initiative exactly. to which you wanted to add something artika yes i would actually i was going to add a, just a point over um, what dufisha has said children are not the only segment in our society that need education and awareness on this mm -hmm. issue it's actually the adults that are they need most needed and required awareness and education for example we talked about the animal critics Hmm. who do not believe that they need that much uh, hmm. freedom or that much facilities hmm. the parents the, uh, the the children they learn from two places their schools their educational institute or their ha home hmm. if the parents are educated if the the society is educated the children are going to pick that up themselves right for example we can use that zoos when they turn into sanctuaries as educational institutes for them right but here another point which also then stems from what you are saying is the fact that when it comes to parents education of course you can't send back the parents to school here a very important responsibility then lies on the media the media has to basically ensure that people are educated they are sensitized about animal welfare and for that i feel that media itself needs to be and civil society and that civil matter. society yes. because, because this is then a responsibility which falls on all stakeholders uh, so i'll come to you and before we conclude the show here it's equally important that we talk about the role of vets like yourself here when it comes to overall improving the quality of Uh, veterinary services in Pakistan and overall improving the standard and of course the quality of uh, you know services which are rendered by people like yourself what is it that we need to do here because a lot of problems also stem from the fact that number one there perhaps might not be enough vets in Pakistan so as to address all these animal exploitation issues and number two even if we do have those vets are they competent enough to do the task that they should be able to do Pakistan is short of vets and uh, we need to have more and more uh, qualified veterinarians in the field mm. and uh, above all we need to have more uh, uh, up to mark diagnostic facilities in the country mm. because uh, this is the thing that hampers our ability to deal with uh, animal disease and diagnostics mm. so uh, to be uh, we need to have up to mark diagnostic facilities in our country uh, we have uh, got very ex experienced and very competent farm animal and dairy vets and poultry vets in country mm. but when it comes to rural areas and the vets who are appointed in rural areas of the country their uh, competency regarding the uh, uh, dog and cat uh, medicine and uh, uh, companion animal medicine is not up to mark so we need to work on capacity building of uh, such veterinarians mm. uh, in order to improve uh, their uh, skills in order to cope up uh, with these problems the on the, the problems right sir your point is noted on which i'll come to you ms atika and before we conclude today so here a very important responsibility also lies on the pakistani media what is it that the media here can do so as to educate people so as to sensitize people about uh, animal rights and animal welfare in the country uh, we have seen the living example of noor jahan's the the turmoil she was going through it was uh, produced all over the media and it was just a social media so mm. uh, the media would be the social media the traditional media the tv the the movie and the entertainment industry uh, when it comes to the media uh, what we can do what they 
to do is produce more documentaries hmm. uh, with more reference to the empathy towards animals and the inter interaction between the animal and the human. If you see, if you go on a social media, you will see a lot of and lot of a hmm. lot of media clippings and the reels and uh, whatnot that right. this is coming from the coming from a where they hmm. show the interaction, human interaction with the animal interaction. Hmm. If we show this, the people who are not children, who cannot go back to school, hmm. they are, they will watch that and they will probably and hopefully get some awareness on that. And perhaps we can also, you know, raise these issues uh, via films, via theater, whether movies, because we do see this exactly. happening with regards to other social issues. So we can actually do the same when it comes to protection of animals too. Uh, that's a point very validly made by yourself on which note I would like to conclude today's show. Thank you so much Ms. Zufisha. Thank you so much sir and thank you so much Ms. Atika for your presence here today. Well to conclude today's show we generally spoke about the ever evolving status of animal welfare and animal rights as it does stand in the Pakistani society. In this regard we also spoke about the various challenges uh, which do come of course with animal exploitation and animal abuse. In this regard whereas of course there is a very dire need to not only upgrade but also to implement the laws that we all do have in place. What is equally important is that we as a society learn to be more kind, we learn to be more compassionate and we definitely learn to be more empathetic towards animals. On that note, signing off for today. Until next time, take care and Allah Hafiz.